Um, as our intern at the Extension Office, she started the day after Memorial Day and uh, already seems like she's been with us forever. We, we appreciate her. Uh, and you know, a lot of her stuff is, a lot of her work this year, is, of course, has been unusual for an intern. She's done a lot of online stuff, but she's also gotten in on some site visits and helping us with various things. Um, she just graduated from Virginia Tech with a degree in animal and poultry science. And she also has a minor in uh, creative writing. So, uh, so she's gonna talk to us tonight about outdoor and nature photography and writing. So, so Emily. Okay, there we go. So yeah, um, like Phil said, my name is Emily Woods. Um, let me see if I can get my screen to share and we will go ahead and Okay, there we go. I think my Wi-Fi is a little patchy. So if I go out, just someone holler at me and I can go back and repeat whatever I need to do. Um, let me go up to the beginning. There we go. Oh, nope. Okay, there we go. Um, so like you said, I'm going to touch a little bit on the nature photography and the nature writing side of it. I did minor in creative writing at Virginia Tech. Um, I spent a lot of time, it was a nice break from the animal science classes and things like that. So I've done a lot of the local contests and things like that. I've been published a couple of times and nothing huge, smaller journals and things like that. But I'm going to start in photography. I know Chris had told me that a few of you are actually really, really good photographers. So y'all most definitely know more than what I already would know. I've been doing it as a hobby for about three years, just on and off. Um, and so I'm just going to go over some things that I've learned from experience and just a little bit of like research and things like that. So just starting out, just some general tips is to keep the purpose in mind. So a lot of this, I know he said like identification, education, that kinds of things. So everything that you're doing as far as that goes needs to keep that purpose in mind. And you can get creative with it. That doesn't mean that you can't. Um, it's just keeping in mind like what you're doing. So if you're doing an identification photo, um, like this one in the top is a really poor identification photo. Like if you were trying to point that out to someone, you wouldn't get very far because it's just kind of that blurry jumbled up mess. And it's hard to actually describe what you're looking at there. But if you were to go down, that one's a little bit clearer and it focuses just a little bit more on the subject matter of the plant, whether you're doing plants or animals or landmarks, whatever it may be. So it's just a good idea to keep in mind like what you're looking for and what you want your audience to see when they're looking at that picture. So um, framing, so just how you put your subject into perspective and where you're putting it in your picture. When you start out, you'll hear a lot, or at least I did, about the rule of thirds. So basically what that's saying is as far as aesthetically or as far as artistic photography goes, very few times will you actually center your subject in the middle of the frame. So it's going to be off to the left or off to the right to one side. Um, if you have a iPhone, I know at least it will do those, you can actually set it to show those grid lines for you. And if not, then it's pretty easy to judge. And it's a pretty easy, pretty neat technique to use um, just to give it a little bit that makes it look a little more creative. It makes it look a little more appealing in a lot of situations. And there are some where you'll see that definitely are centered. It just depends on honestly what you like to do, but you'll definitely hear about the rule of thirds and it just helps to have that, your main subject a little off to the side one way or the other. Another one sounds really simple, but it's just to take more than one picture. So one reason is your first picture is, you're always gonna get one or two pictures that you're going to discard or you're going to trash. They're just never going to look right. Also, it helps if you're taking pictures, especially like plants and animals and things like that, to make sure you get the entire subject in a picture. So whether that means taking a top view and a side view or a front view and a side view, whatever that may be, taking multiple pictures from multiple angles is just going to help 
get a better picture, get a cleaner picture, and then also make sure that you're encompassing the whole subject of what you're trying to capture. So especially if you're going for like something to use in an educational setting later or to show someone later, then it helps to be able to say like, look, this is a picture, this is a picture. And it kind of gives a wider view of what you're trying to say. And then your equipment, whether like it's a phone or a camera, I unfortunately don't have a phone that takes very good pictures. So I normally use my camera, um, but whatever it is, just play around with it and get familiar with it because it doesn't do anyone a whole lot of good to have something they can't use. I tried, when I first got my camera, I tried to use it before I knew a thing about anything and I wasn't having any luck. It just didn't work out very well. And that tends, I think, to be the experience unless you play around with it a little bit and read the owner's manual and go and look up some things about how to use it. So just kind of know what you're using. So on a little bit, um, when you're talking at least like camera photography, three things you're going to hear a lot are ISO, aperture, and then shutter speed. So we're go I'm going to kind of encompass at least aperture and shutter speed tonight and with other things. But if you don't have a camera, there are things you can do with a phone or anything else that you're using to kind of create the same, um, same, I guess, techniques or same look. Um, but for one is like isolating the object. So whatever it is you're trying to, cap to capture to just kind of make it pop and to stand out so everyone is automatically, that's what they're drawn to when they look at your photo. So the easiest way, like one of the easiest ways to do that is if you're using a camera, you can adjust your aperture. So basically that just means the width of your field or how much space is between the edge of your field and that lens. So if this one is backwards, a higher f-stop or a higher f-value actually means that it's letting less light in. So if you're using, or if you're in a situation where it's close to dark or you're not getting much light, then setting it to a high number isn't going to help you much. It's just going to create a dark picture. You're not gonna get a lot of light in there. But one of the really cool things about it is once you narrow that field of where you're letting your light in, it kind of blurs out the background. So that's very similar to, I know at least iPhones, I'm not super sure about Androids, but iPhones have a portrait mode now and it works on objects as well as people. You can kind of get it to work. And it's that same thing of where it focuses in on your object and then it kind of blurs out the background. So that can be really useful in identification photos when you're looking and saying like, oh, this is what I want to pop, then you know kind of where to set your focus and you can kind of let the rest fade into the background. So I have a couple of pictures. Um, I do apologize. I've been moving in and out. So a lot of my newer pictures are boxed up places. So these are some old pictures. So some of them aren't entirely in focus, but they'll at least hopefully get the point across. So the ones on the left are using a higher aperture, which means that the, low, the F values or the F stops are going to be lower. And then as you go across, you can see where it's a lower aperture or like a higher F stop or higher F value. And you can kind of see how, oh, how this one is really sharp. Everything is kind of in the foreground and you can still tell like what the subject is be that purple flower still kind of catches your attention. But whereas if you're going over to the rows, and I don't know if y'all can see this because it's um, not, is covered up on my side. But this one, the background is pretty blurred out. And so it just really is a way to capture the attention of your audience and say like, look at this. So it's a great way to direct your attention. And if you're looking at identification photos and that kind of things, it's really easy to say like, yes, this is what you're looking at and this is what you're identifying. So the next thing to do, I love, um, I love animals. I'm an animal science major. So I've spent a lot of time photographing animals. I also, when I first started, did a lot of water. Um, we had some really pretty waterfalls and up around tech. So I do a lot of, with those. Um, but being able to catch that movement or show the movement if you don't want to freeze it is a really cool way to kind of make your photos more artistic without compromising the value or compromising the um, framing of them be like, it's still easy to tell what they are. So the easiest way to do that is shutter speed. So on a camera, it's really easy to adjust your shutter speed up and down. And that's just how long your shutter is staying open when it's capturing that image. So 
anyone who's ever taken a picture knows that motion equals blur. So if you're going to take a picture and someone is moving, then the picture is going to turn out blurry. So a higher shutter speed kind of catches that image in time. So if you've ever seen a picture of like someone riding a bike, but it looks still, then that means that they're high, really high shutter speed. But you can also use it in reverse to kind of show movement or show um, progression over time. So it's really useful, especially in animals or wild animals. Um, I was up at the Red Fox Trail and was, I guess it was last week, and I found a little baby rabbit and I don't have those picture, that picture, I wish I did. Um, but I was taking pictures, oops, I was taking pictures of him and he was moving. So anything that's going to move away from you or might move quickly, a higher shutter speed is useful. If you're trying to take pictures of something delicate, like a delicate plant or something like that, and it's windy and it's kind of swaying back and forth, a higher shutter speed can kind of help you capture that movement. And then water. Water is one of those where it's really easy to get artistic with it once you adjust your shutter speed. So once again, these pictures, some of them are a little out of focus, but um, so this one is a high shutter speed. And if you look, it really kind of captures the individual drops And this picture shows it especially well. This is a zoom, a zoomed in section of one that I had taken quite some time ago. Um, but you can see the individual water drops coming up and you can kind of see how this one, this one's a little blurry, unfortunately. Um, but you can kind of see how it's dripping down and you can kind of see each more each, so each individual drop. Whereas this one really captures the movement and the flow of the river and it catches the water kind of rolling down the waterfall. So it's a really neat tool to use and to play around with. And it's one of those that are really easy to do. So that's kind of like my whole thing on photography. It's not super in depth or super detailed, um, but writing, this is one of my favorite things to do. It's, I think it's one of the most relaxing things to do. And if you do go somewhere or do something, and this kind of goes with photography too, that you're capturing it and it, you're capturing a way that it made you feel or a way that it made you think. And so that's the beauty of being able to take a picture or to write about it, is that it kind of captures it so you can look back and remember it. So this is one of my favorite quotes, and it says, writing is a conversation with reading, a dialogue with thinking. And Nikki Giovanni, who I don't know if y'all have ever heard of her, she's a poet, um, but she was one of my creative writing professors at Virginia Tech, and she really kind of drove home this thought of there is no technically bad writing. You can do something that doesn't sound very good, but she always said at the end of the day, a, a bad poem isn't going to kill anyone. Whereas like if an engineer went out and had a bad day at work and did a bad job, then it could end up having serious consequences. So writing is one of those things where you can go and you can make mistakes and not have to worry about it a lot. But it really is a dialogue with thinking. So it's this back and forth of knowing what you're thinking and knowing what you saw and then being able to actually put it down on paper. So that's really, really cool. Um, so once again, just general tips, take notes as you go. I was really bad for this, especially if I'm going out hiking or something that I'm not looking at what I'm seeing as I go. I'm not taking notes. I would leave everything in the car. And I'm really good about saying, I'll remember it. I know what it looks like. I'm good. I've got it. And then I wait too long. So if you're waiting a really long time to write it down, and you're going to forget those details, all these things that you think you're going to remember, you're not. And unfortunately, normally those are the really special and the really detailed observations that you're making that can really stand out and really just make, whether it's a journal or whatever it is, when you go back and read it, you're, you're not going to catch the same feeling that you did. So always make sure I always take a notebook. Um, I take notes as I go. I, if I'm taking pictures with it, then my camera has a number for the picture. I write down the number of the picture and I write down some details about that picture. That way I'm not confused about, wait, which plant was this or where was this? I know exactly as I'm going along what it is. And it doesn't have to even be long. It can just be, I take shorthand and just kind of scribble something down so I can go back and look at it later. Another thing is just be vivid. Um, it's super easy to get caught up in the normal, the big things. So this is what it looks like every time. 
Um, but, but we forget the little things, I think, sometimes. And I remember having an author come in and speak to us, and he was reading a piece that he had just written, and he talked about um, a, this place that was run down and wasn't, it was in disrepair, it wasn't somewhere that he wanted to be. And he talked about it and he did the general like dilapidated building and that kind of thing. But then he brought it down and he had a sentence where he mentioned that he looked down and it was gravel and there was a bottle cap on, on the edge of the gravel. And it's those things, those details that when you read it, we don't think about. But when you really start to think how many places have we been that are just like that. And those are the things we see, but we don't process. So take some time, I would look like, feel like if it's a plant, it's super easy to feel it, smell it, see those really small details and just get out from how it looks. Like those are the big things that you write down and those are the things that you remember and that you can capture with a picture. But how it feels and how it smells are a little harder. So those are things I would capture and write down the small details. I would also say let it sit and then come back to it. So that's especially easy with a journal when you're keeping like a nature journal or that kind of stuff because you can kind of write it down and know what you're doing and then you can come back later and you can either add to it or kind of rewrite it. It's one of those things that's easy to keep going because these places for the most part are always there to revisit and so it's easy to keep adding to these places as you're going to them. Um, but I usually, if I'm writing something, I'm going to finish it and then I'm going to walk away and forget about it for a week. And then I'm going to come back and look at it again. And it's a really, also a really nice opportunity if you're going somewhere, especially if it's somewhere that you really love being. And if it's a trail you love or a lake you love or whatever it is, then going back and rereading that and having that chance to rewrite it is a chance to relive it. And so that's one of the best things. Um, and it just lets you think about it and sit back and once again, just relive it and be like, oh, what did I leave out? Or, oh, what would I like to add into it? And then also have a hard copy. I keep everything that I do. I have a hard copy and a flash drive copy. And one of, I think the best things, especially when I'm journaling, um, I know that there's like Pinzu, a lot of different online journals now that are free that you can go and you can type in everything in journal. I still love to take a paper and just write it down. I think especially with a journal or something that I'm adding pictures to or some, like an experience that I had, it makes it a lot more meaningful if I'm sitting down and thinking about it as I'm writing it out. It forces you to slow down and it forces you to just kind of sit back and think about it a while. And it's also really easy. I am not a one notebook person. Um, I was talking to Phil about this earlier today, how I have a notebook for quotes and I have a notebook for places I've been and I have a notebook of story ideas. Like everything has a notebook. But if you're one of those people who's like a one notebook type of person and this is my nature journal, this or this is my log of everywhere I've been, then it's really easy to sit down with those notes that you've taken during a hike or over the course of a trip and look back and just flip a page back and forth. And that can be kind of cool to see the progression too. So if you're like, whether you have one notebook, two notebooks, I would just, I would invest in one just to sit down and actually be able to write and then it doesn't have to be anything fancy. So one of the big things, um, especially with journaling, is do you stay subjective or objective? And especially because journaling and nature journaling in particular because you're outside and you're, it's a way that you think and it's a way that you feel and it's a place that you like or you dislike. It's a form of creative nonfiction and that's what makes it really easy to work with. But it's this question of, well, it's supposed to be nonfiction. So do I stay subjective, what the plant looks like, what it feels like, or am I able to get some objective pieces in there too about what it makes, um, excuse me, you start out with the objective about what it feels like, what it looks like, and then you add in that subjective piece of like what you feel. So you can use both. Those objective pieces are your framework. Those are the building blocks of what you're building around. So those are your facts. But then you're actually able to come in with your subjective and that's how you flesh it out. And that's how you make it different from someone else's. So I love when we would go out and do things and we would go places 
um, we would hike, we had part of the Appalachian Trail Nears and we would go on the Appalachian Trail all the time. And we would, I had a couple different friends who would keep journals and things like that. And what I would do is totally different from what they would do. And that's just because of the subjective portion of it. What we saw is the same, but what we thought and what we felt is different. So I would really encourage you to not just stick with what you saw but go a little bit beyond that. So the objective is really easy. It's your identification photo. So all those pictures you took earlier are the plants or the animals or the landmarks or whatever that might be. And then you name them and you put their other names and you put their facts, what they're used for, where they're found, what environment they like. Um, anything else about what, what you would use to identify or what you would use to describe it to somebody. And a lot of times, or at least for me, this kind of takes on a list form where I'll put a picture up top and then I will go down and I like bulleted lists and I will be like, you know, this is the name, also known as this, also known as this, and this is where I found it and this is where it normally likes to live. And so I'm going to go back and forth with that and I make a list. And so that's kind of your objective straight. And I do keep a page like that because I like to be able to go back. If I'm looking for something specific, I don't always want to sift through everything else. It's nice to have a clean, neat, bulleted list. So I do kind of keep those, but I also, my next page is going to be that plus some more. So that's when I go into the subjective. So that kind of allows you that room to experiment and grow and do that like bad writing. Um, and it's just practice until it becomes comfortable. And that's where you put, if you're experimenting with your pictures and if some of them you're like, yeah, this isn't one that I would just use to show someone like, this is what this plant looks like, but it's really pretty. It's a scene, maybe from like the top of a mountain or from the top of an overlook, wherever you've been hiking or that kind of thing. That's where those kind of go in. It's those pictures that you really like, but you kind of experiment it with, or you kind of um, pushed the rules a little bit with. And it's what you felt, it's what you liked, it's what you didn't like, it's what you are comparing it to. Um, those are things that everyone's going to have a different opinion on. So that's the part where you get to come in and be like, this is what I loved, or like, this is what I felt. So once again, when I was on that Red Fox Trail, it was, it's kind of creepy once you get to the Killing Rock, um, because it was just, it's quiet and it's a place to think. And it's one of those places where you know what happened. And so it's, it, it's one of the, it's, I don't know. For me, I go back and I write about it and I write about it being like almost eerie. Whereas like 50 feet or a hundred feet down the trail, like I thought it was a lot prettier and more peaceful. So it's just, it's different for everyone. Um, my fiance just thought it was super cool. He was with me and he'd never heard this story before. So he was going and he was reading the signs and he was super excited about it. So it's different for everyone, but it allows you that time to use language and expressions. Um, and this quote right here is actually oh, from one of my last um, pieces that I wrote when I was in college. And this was actually, um, this was creative nonfiction, but it was a little more leaning toward the fiction side. So it had some true elements in it, but it was also pretty heavily fictional fiction. Um, but it says he has blue eyes, so light that they reminded me of the sky in the morning before all the fog rises, a kind of half blue, half gray color. And I was writing about the grandfather. And I was writing, um, I kept thinking about how when you're looking out over the mountains in the morning and that, that fog is rising, and it's kind of that same color. And so that's what you're doing, whether you're writing about people or not, it's the same technique everywhere you go as where you're comparing it to your experiences before. So I love to be able to look back at the logs of places I've been and things I've seen and being like, yes, this place reminds me of this other place I've been. So I was up, once again, when I was in Blacksburg, we would hike McAfee's Knob, a part of the Appalachian Trail. And you get to an overlook, and then you can go about 45 minutes the other direction and end up at Bald Knob, which is an, another, it's a shorter hike up to an overlook. And 
for me, they were very sim similar. They had kind of that same feeling. And so I, I would write about how they kind of felt close to each other. And it's the same, um, it's the same landscape. It's the same place. So you, it's okay to feel or write the same things about multiple places that you've been. So, and this is just a little bit about creative writing and some like things that I would suggest, especially if you're keeping a journal, go to the same place in multiple seasons. Um, I'm really bad for summer and fall, like in the winter and the spring, I get cold and I don't like to go places, but you'll see the same thing over and over again, but you'll see it differently once you see it in the light of the changing seasons. So that's one of my favorite things to do. And people will do this with pictures too, where they'll go back to the same place and take a picture from the same viewpoint in all four seasons and kind of show the change. And if you're going back to the same place, pick a place that you already know and pick a place that you already like and just spend some time there in each season to be able to journal that and be able to like kind of document the changes that it goes through. And then invest some time into shorter walks, shorter distances. Um, there are days that I've hiked 10 miles, there are times when I have hiked two. And you can spend the same amount of time on both. So you can spend three or four hours going just a couple of miles if you're taking your time and looking at things and really taking it in. And I think that's one of the best things to do is just to be able to slow down and not focus so much on getting to the end of a trail or getting to the top of a mountain just take some time to take these shorter walks, these shorter spaces, and really invest into looking and watching and seeing what you know, seeing what you can already identify, taking pictures of what you can't, finding the answers. And it's that kind of thing that teaches you to observe and teaches you to see things that you haven't saw before. And it's really cool to go somewhere that you've been and maybe not taken that time and just put in the effort to try to see it as if you'd never been there before and take time to go down and look at all these little details that you might have missed. So, and then one of, I think I, one of the reasons I love journaling is because it is true and it's because it comes strictly from you. There's no other source material a lot of times other than if you've been like using something to identify a species or something like that. But this is strictly from you. This is what you have seen. These are the places that you have been. So when you're taking these, they make really good backdrops for anything else that you want to write. So whether that's poetry or fiction, journaling is a type of creative nonfiction that can really easily be turned into other types of creative nonfiction. Essays, for one, is just a longer, almost a longer form of a journal page. Um, and all, all of these kind of work together. But if you can't write from experience, then you're going to miss something. You're not going to be able to add into the writing what you should. So once you go out and journal, it's really easy. There are places to blog. There are places that accept submissions. There are places that Virginia Tech is doing a um, collection of works right now that actually include journal entries. So these are things that are very shareable of experiences that you've had and places that you've went and places that you've seen. It's very easy to take that and then be able to share that with someone else. And that's one of the really cool things about it um, is that it's really easy to kind of get that out there, whether you want to keep it strictly in journal form or whether you want to kind of use that as a backdrop for something else. So, and then there are several, one of the easiest ways is just to Google um, journals and things like that that do take submissions and especially in the past probably three or four years there's been a large kind of uptick in what people want as far as genres go and Appalachian literature or literature focusing on this area has actually become more popular in mainstream literature than what it has been in the past which is really cool so it's a it's a good time to kind of put your thoughts out there and put an area that you know very well out there. So, um, but that's it. It was fairly short. I apologize for that. Um, I feel like I keep going under the time, but are there any questions? Um, I will be more than happy to.
or we can ask questions or you can type them into the chat box if you don't want to unmute your sound. I'm interested in finding a camera. So I would take, I've got some information from Chris, but if anybody's got any ideas on a camera, not extremely expensive, because I got to do a <laughs> computer too. So. <laughs> I know, at least for me, um, which I watched sales and I got mine when it was a little bit more on sale. Um, I know people who use Nikons and Canons both. I have a Nikon D3400. Um, so it's a, it's a good um, kind of beginning camera. So it's not, it's going to do basically anything you need it to do, um, but it's not up there. It's not gonna cost you a thousand dollars. So that was, for me, one of the big things. I like a Canon, and a good starting point is a Canon Rebel. Mm -hmm. I, I think a Canon or an Icon either is good. I'm taking notes, so I'll mm -hmm. go look them all up. So. <laughs> If you're going to photograph flowers and wildlife, you need a, a longer lens, 100 to 200, 100 to 200, and uh, we need a good photography class, don't we? Sounds good to me. I'll join. Can, can we have one of those and count it? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, well, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of continuing education, uh, doing a photography class, I'm sure it could be uh, uh, used for uh, for hours on that. Uh, Bill Harris, of course, is retired now, but he was, you know, he used to teach uh, photography for years at Mountain Empire, uh, and I picked up a few uh, tricks along the way from uh, working with Bill. Uh, he'd do a uh, scientific photography every summer as part of our governor's school. That was years ago. Uh, when, when we were doing that. Of course, that was in the day when we'd have to process our own film and do slides. and had to be more careful taking a picture because it, it costs you more. Um, you know, I had so much to buy the slide film. Now with the digital cameras, you can just snap, 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 and just throw away the, the rotten ones, which is what I do a lot of, and, uh, uh, you know, keep the better ones. So that uh, digital photography has really changed. Um, the, a landscape for a lot of us. Well, that'd be a good thing to look into. I may talk with Bill some more about seeing what he might be able to do with uh, some photography training for our group in the future. I enjoyed your uh, presentation on the writing, Emily. Uh, something that's a weakness of my own, you know, doing journaling and all that. Uh, uh, when we do our training, we have to keep journals and that's about as far as it goes uh, after a complete training I haven't done a whole lot of uh, note taking myself so uh, uh, hopefully that will inspire us to maybe do a little bit more along those lines and, and uh, keep better notes as uh, we do our hikes. I'm still fading in and out. Scotty's still having trouble with the uh, beam me in. <laughs> Take yeah. Any other questions? Well, Emily, thank you so much for doing this for us. We, we do appreciate it uh, so much. And uh, I know you got a big weekend coming up, and a lot of clients are taking your time to uh, uh, do this and prepare for this on top of the other things that are going on in your life. We wish you the very best uh, in all. Enjoyed uh, the presentation immensely. Thank you. Thank you for letting Thank me you. speak to y'all. Thank you, Emily. Um, I do have a couple things.